Um, welcome to the to the planning and the revolution uh, <coughs> session this afternoon. Then we have four speakers. Uh, they will each speak for 15 minutes, and then we will have 15 minutes of questions. But if there's any burning issues that anybody wants to throw at them, I'm sure you can throw it at them if they're talking through their hat or you think they're talking through their hat. Uh, but there will be questions and answers at the end then, and um, I, will st I will be keeping very strictly to time. The four, the four speakers then, um, in order of their presentations, will be Paul Allen from the Centre for Alternative Technology, Jamie Gordon, Remarkable Pendragon, David Toke, Aberdeen University, and Jenny Hogan, Scottish Renewables. And we'll start then with Paul. He's got a varied um, background. Um, he's been at the CAT for some time and a wonderful institution, I must say, that it is. I've been there many times. It gets better and better. Um, and uh, he's external relations officer now, leading the groundbreaking Zero Carbon Britain Research Project. Um, he's uh, a fellow of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. He's uh, on the Wales Science Advisory Council and he's uh, Climate Change Commission for Wales and the Fellow of the RSA. So uh, a nice background from which to, to, to start. And he's going to be talking today on managing demand and supply then in a net zero energy emission system. Rigorous stuff. Okay, over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. So if we're thinking about planning a revolution, it's important that the plans we make are based in the evidence given to us by the science. There's a lot of stuff going on about green things, but a lot of it is framed around what is politically realistic, what is acceptable to business, what government are happy with. What we're interested in is what is actually framed by the evidence base of the climate science itself. If you look at the fifth assessment report of the IPCC published last year, the evidence is to stand an 80% chance, which many people don't think is a very good chance. It's a one in five, four in five chance of keeping below the crucial two degrees C globally agreed climate tipping point. We have to be thinking about getting towards net zero emissions globally by about 2050 to 2070. That is not far away, and that is a very serious target. The World Bank have been talking about that last week. This week, the IMF came out with a report saying that the actual costs of business as usual fossil fuels is actually about 500 trillion pounds a year more than what we're, we're actually putting down to it because of all the externalized costs. So there's a lot of evidence we have to make this shift. So we've done a zero carbon Britain based on 40 years of CATS experience to one possible scenario showing a rapid decarbonisation to open conversations about what this might actually entail to try and identify areas of new research. If you're going to decarbonise, you have to understand, first of all, where the emissions come from. Most of our 650 million tonnes of greenhouse gases actually come from... Uh, burning energy. 550 million come from burning energy. But there are some non-energy emissions we have to deal with, and there are some land use emissions, particularly fronts and backs of cows. There are also some net negative processes, the other side of the white line, which, which can actually lock up carbon, that exist all the time within natural systems, but they're way out of balance of the amount of carbon we're giving off. So to really get an understanding of the 650 million tons we give off every day, we have to understand that the amount of energy we use in a typical average normal day is not, in fact, normal at all. Looking over a historical timeline, even for the um, world per capita annual primary energy use, <clears throat> we're at an extreme point. We're using more energy now than we've ever used before. Powering our everyday lives, what is like a normal Saturday, in Cardiff is not normal. It's uh, a huge amount of energy. And a lot of it is moving goods, heating buildings, manufacturing things, which are quite deliberately designed to consume more energy, to consume more stuff, because it's good for boosting the high street economy. So the first thing we must understand is we have to move away from that. We have to think about powering down the amount of energy we're actually using. That is really what I mean by managing demand. 
So we're exploring a 60% reduction over a few decades of how we could begin to pull back from this extreme energy use position to a more reasonable, more like a 1940s, 1950s amount of energy. If we look at um, what we've got there, 2010, we need to reduce by about 60% by going through all of these different parts of how we use energy and identifying smart modern ways of using it that are much, much more efficient. For example, in buildings and heating and hot water, we can achieve a 60% cut if we radically overhaul the systems. It's not inbuilt that we have to use so much energy. If we take an average UK house, it's something like 10,000 kilowatt hours per year to heat it to provide hot water. If we insulate the roof, the floor, the better windows, the doors, reduce drafts, air leakage, better controls, better internal temperatures, we can get that down to about 4,000 kilowatt hours. There's 20 million houses to do in 20 years, but each house you do actually saves you money by the end of the 20 years because of the amount of energy it saves. Similarly, looking at transport, moving huge amounts of people around in almost a ton of steel powered by an internal combustion engine is about 18% efficient. It's a very inefficient way of moving people and goods around. If we can think again about our transport systems and make them work for the benefit of the population, we can reduce the amount of distance that people need to travel in cars, in individual mobility, by improving the public transport systems, by making them work for the benefit of the citizens, by linking trains and buses together, by enabling people to walk more and cycle more, we can actually reduce the amount of miles people need to travel. But then we can also improve the efficiency by shifting to light, smart electric vehicle systems for inner city areas and much better fast roll, road rail and coach systems for between cities. It's possible to radically power down the amount of energy we use. Energy is pouring out of our ears, left, right and centre. If we can achieve a 60% reduction in energy demand, then powering up renewables to meet that demand becomes perfectly feasible. There's easily enough energy out there surrounding Wales, surrounding the UK, to power the UK. There's enough energy. We know the energy is there, but the question that a lot of people ask is how can we keep the lights on during the periods of when we're becalmed at minus 17 in the middle of the winter when the wind isn't blowing. This is what causes a lot of concern amongst people. So we, in our latest report, we employed an energy modeler who did detailed hour-by-hour -hour modeling. We, we took a data set of 10 years' worth of real-world weather data modeled on an hourly basis from 2002 to 2011, 87,000 hours, and used that to model, first of all, the actual output from offshore wind farms, and then scaled that up to the most appropriate sites to come up with a detailed mapped picture of when that energy would be available on an hourly basis. We then added to that onshore wind, solar, PV, solar heating, geothermal, hydropower, to come up with a very detailed understanding of when the energy is available. We then took the same data set and used that to model the power down demand, because even if you reduce demand, it still peaks and troughs. It changes with the season, it changes with the time of day. So we thoroughly mapped out supply and demand of energy to the point where we could begin to integrate the two together. And when you begin to cross the two graphs, you can then identify the periods of surplus and deficit. And you can look at how increasing and decreasing installed capacity begins to help fill them and optimize that, and then look at what we can do to move energy from the times of surplus to the times of deficit. Looking at energy balancing, first of all, short-term demand side management, that's when we charge electric cars, or if I want to wash my shirt, I put it in the machine and press cheapest, and the machine talks to the grid and it does the washing in the middle of the night, or moving industrial loads. We found that about 25 gigawatt hours we could move around through demand side management. Similarly, 25 gigawatt hours we could move around through pump storage and heat storage by using heat pumps to heat thermal mass in buildings means you can use the heat pump at particular times of day when it suits you and use the thermal lag in the buildings. But 
that sort of 150 gigawatt hours is nowhere near the amount of energy we need to move. We need to store about 1,000 gigawatt hours. So we began looking at all of the available technologies to see what could possibly be dispatched to fill these gaps between the big renewables. Not batteries, not pump storage, compressed air, flywheels. What we found is the most appropriate technology for that is combined cycle gas turbine plants. They're efficient, they can start within an hour, very flexible, ramping up and down. They can track the, uh, the gaps in the big renewables, but unfortunately they run on methane. So we began to think about what we could power them with. And we found that we can actually synthetically make methane. You can upgrade hydrogen into methane by a process called the Sabatier reaction. It's well proven. It's, it's documented chemistry. So we can then take the uh, surplus electricity when the offshore winds are flying around in the middle of night. Nobody wants the, that electricity. We can electrolyze water, split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then take that hydrogen and capture biomass from the atmosphere using plant life and use that biomass to create carbon dioxide to cross with the hydrogen to upgrade it to methane or to synthetic liquid fuels because that's the infrastructure we have. We already have the pipelines, the fueling stations, we already have the uh, combined cycle gas turbines. We can then use that as the backup to fill the gaps between the big renewables. And in the analysis we found that 82% of the time our model supply exceeded demand. But there was 18% of the time where we, it didn't. So we had to look at what we can dispatch. The short-term storage and demand shifting could deal with about 3%. It reduced the 18% down to 15%. And that final 15% we found we could provide with the biogas and carbon neutral synthetic gas systems. And we've just published a paper in carbon management on the detailed modeling of this to get robust peer-reviewed research out there. But in order to do that, it means rethinking land use. So we have to think, how do we use land more effectively? So that means thinking about what we eat. The inner circles there are presented to us by our dietitian. We then hired a dietitian to help us understand what people eat. The right mix of foods is represented by the inner circle, but the outer circle is an average diet today. And we're eating far too much high-fat, sugary stuff. We're eating nowhere near enough fruit and veg. If we bring the sort of diet that we eat round about matching what is good for a healthy human being, we find that we can actually begin to rethink land use. Huge amounts of land are actually spent if we map out per mega hectare land use in Britain today, producing food to feed to animals so we can eat the animals. If we reduce that to the amount that is appropriate to the amount of meat we need to eat so that we can increase the amount of food we produce ourselves, then we can free up land that we can use for capturing the carbon to upgrade the methane, but also to increase the carbon capture and storage to begin to balance the residual emissions, to get us towards net zero. That doesn't mean everybody has to become vegetarian. It means that we still use the uplands or the spaces between the PV mm -hmm. banks for sheep and for grazing, but we aim to produce the right amount of meat, fatty foods and sugary foods that match our diet. So then we can begin to reduce our emissions to the point where we come towards net zero because it's our obligation as a long industrialized country that has led the world into fossil fuels to, to show how we can move towards the sort of living systems that can enable a under two degrees C stable climate future and the well-being of future generations. So we're going around with this to try and open conversations, get people talking about these sorts of futures. And in doing it, we're finding that there's all sorts of other people around the world doing all sorts of other modeling. Uh, Stanford's got 50 plans for 50 states for 100% renewables. You click on Ohio, it shows you all of the different renewables available in Ohio, how they can match supply and demand, the jobs created, but they're also including the mortality costs, the, the cost of the people who get ill in urban environments because of the exhaust emissions. They've calculated the amount of land and the overall costs, very similar to the uh, IMF's costs yesterday for the, uh, the total costs of burning fossil fuels. Similarly, Zero Carbon Australia, there are plans emerging from all over the world beginning to map out this. Project Zero from Denmark is aiming to get to net zero by 2029. We're pulling all of these rapid decarbonisation reports into one synthesis report 
which we're taking to the UNFCCC process meeting in Bonn in a couple of weeks. And the whole Zero Carbon Britain project is free to download from the CAT website. We don't aim it to be the one way to save the planet, but a, an evidence-based scenario rooted in what the climate science demands that can begin to open conversations in all sectors of society about the sort of rates of change that the science demands. And uh, there's some uh, six-page summaries on the little uh, table at the front if anybody wants to take one away. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you ever so much indeed for sticking the time on your interesting film. Thank you very much indeed for Thank you. Thank you. As I say, we'll have the um, <clears throat> questions and answers towards the end. But now we have um, Jamie Gordon then. Um, Jamie... <clears throat> The director of uh, the Remarkable Pendragon, who, by the way, is sponsoring uh, the session today. So thank you very much indeed, Jamie, for that. Um, he's been um, more than he has 20, more than 20 years' experience in the communication sector, particular expertise in community and stakeholder engagement, which is very interesting. And today he's going to be talking about communities. In fact, how we should view them <clears throat> as potential advocates, but also we should see them as constraints. And he's going to really be talking about that into that sort of balance, if you like, and its implications for developers. Uh, Jamie, over to you. Thank you very much. And I should have, by the way, introduced myself at the beginning, because I, I didn't, and I'm Brian Morgan, by the way, and I'm very pleased to be here as well. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. Plen uh, Da. Thank you for that welcome, Brian. Um, I'm slightly concerned with all these eminent academics that have been kind of booked for the wrong gig, and I'm here as the kind of post-lunch jester to keep <laughs> you awake. But, Hopefully, I'll do my best. Uh, I'll keep it down to 15 minutes. I went to a big sales pitch about Pendragon. We have a stand in the hall if you want to pick up some literature afterwards. Uh, but I will be talking about successful engagement and what that means. It's different things to different people. That's probably what we look upon as pretty successful engagement. Unfortunately, as we know, the community might look upon it as that. That's the outcome they may prefer. And sometimes we are at odds with the communities we deal with. Our needs case of just, we will reduce CO2, is not often enough for these people. They'll just come back and say, well, great, don't mind that, it's very good of you, but can you put it somewhere else? And that all too often is the outcome, unfortunately. What I'm looking at today is what is the perfect stakeholder engagement? Well, it happens when stakeholders and their developers understand their level of influence, believe they have been listened to, and respect the outcome. And what exactly do I mean by that? Can the community really affect and influence the decision? And we have to be honest about this from the outset. Have they been listened to throughout the process? And as Carl Sargent said early on, he suggested that in industry, we have to really up our game a bit here. And what is the way, as a developer, we can most influence a community? And it's probably as simple as this. It's actually where we choose to develop in the first place. That's probably the biggest influencing factor. So, site selection. Now, site selection is obviously done on numerous levels of constraint, whether they be economic, environmental, archaeological, various other things. But very seldomly do we necessarily look at the human factor. And we do need to treat the human factor as a constraint. If you had two sites with exactly the same connection options and everything else was level, wouldn't you prefer to go to the site where you knew you would get consent and support from the community rather than the one where you're going to get a huge amount of protest and probably, possibly, not get consent? And there are data sets that you can capture covertly before even land agreements are made to at least give you a level of risk against that. Some demographics that you can look at. Fairly simply, where do people live? Now, theoretically, obviously, well, we're very fortunate here in Wales. There's a big bit in the middle that isn't hugely populous. And there's connections and various other things going for it. And this is acquired data. This is stuff you can just get for free off the internet. There's other stuff you can get for free off the internet as well. And this is another form of data. This is presumed data. This is where you have one data set you know has a certain attribute. 
And so you can make a presumption that it could cause <coughs> some issues. Here's the data set for age. And as you can see, that very same area is a more aging population. And one of the things about an aging population is they do tend to be slightly more difficult to convince on the renewable argument. Unfortunately, this is the case. And from my own experience, and probably from many of you in the room, you'll find that process groups are often run by um, people in an elderly population. They have more time on their hands. And they also have a higher propensity to own their properties, which is another issue that ups the matrices on whether they're going to be anti a renewable developer or not. Here's another piece of presumed data. You might say it's not presumed at all. These are the results from May the 7th. The people there did vote these people in, so one can presume they believe in an element of their manifestos. If you were going to build an offshore wind farm on that map somewhere, one presumes it would be quite good to do it there, where we have a green MP, and not, let's say, somewhere down here. Um, I'm not suggesting Rampion and Navitas were actually basing their site selection purely on that map, because, of course, they did it before the election. But um, certainly that is very important data to look at. Here's another one, presumed data. Anyone got any ideas what that is? It's Welsh speakers. And I couldn't find any correlation between Welsh speakers and acceptance of uh, renewables on the internet. But if there was one, then you could use this and make some presumptions. What you can use this for, obviously, is part of your comms plan. You know fully well, anywhere in Wales, you need to be bilingual. But perhaps in an area like this, it would be more important to come up with a project name that's in Welsh or have more bilingual speakers or, or whatever. These are just data sets you can use to help get things through. Response data. Now, response data obviously <laughs> tends to be gathered at the <coughs> consultation phase, but there's lots of other response data you can use. Historic data have similar planning applications being rejected in the area. It's always very important. You can, d you can get a lot of data covertly by sponsoring things like Mori polls and stuff. Might not be totally accurate because of statistical significance if you're talking about a small community, but it can give you some insight. You're more likely to get the response data, obviously, through the consultation, and particularly if your planning application is something like a DCO, where through legislation you will have to have a very robust process of capturing opinion. Political mapping. Well, political mapping should be looked at as a constraint. Um, politicians chop and change, but they tend to stay in power for at least a, a, a minimum term. But the timelines of your mapping is fairly crucial. We've seen a, a huge shift in the last two weeks of where we stand. So if you're looking at doing something just before an election, it could well be more tricky because you could be swept up in becoming an election topic locally. You get influence from outside your community. It's not just your direct community representatives you've got to map. It's actually party politics and various other influences, whether it be assembly government as well. And also the size. Different sizes of development obviously take different routes to gain consent, and hence different levels of politics are kicked in within that decision-making process. There's every chance, of course, under the Welsh Planning Act that's going through that there might be a third level that hasn't decided at what kind of megawattage that will be kicked in, that's at consultation phase at the moment, as of Tuesday, but it could well be that some selection can be made there. This is Wales, or as of 2012, I have to admit. But you can see a huge amount of it, there's no over control, overall control. This often means that local politics really does play. It could well be that your community councillor or district councillor is a personality that everyone really respects, hence they voted he or her in, and hence they are going to be hugely influential and you have to get, if you can, get them on board. These are the very many ways in which you can influence politicians. Um, you've got the local community is by far the biggest one. 
change the channel and the messaging depending on the influencing factor you're using. MPs, obviously, MEPs even. And advocates are crucial. Trying to get advocates, particularly credible ones, credible ones on board, is a real winner. NCOs, for instance, if you can get somebody from a Greenpeace or Friends of the Earth to stand up in your church hall when you're doing your exhibition, it really does obviously help. And this could be a, a typical campaign using political mapping where you've got all your activity, whether it be trade press, cascading support from the NGOs, <coughs> an advocacy program to try and get some myth busters out there. This is quite crucial. We all know that the protest groups start their Facebook pages within minutes of hearing the news. And some of the stuff you read on these things is, is beggars belief, really. But if you can get an independent party, an NGO, to be an advocate and go out there and bust some of these myths and maybe use social media yourselves, it's a real help. We've got other, other aspects, obviously, this, apart from the social media newsletters and collateral going out to the community itself. So you've got to have them understand their level of in influence. Well, we kind of know what ours are site selection, consultation, communication phase, but what's theirs? Well, you've got to communicate this at the start of the process. If they don't actually know what they're being consulted on and to what effect they can change things, you're just going to come a cropper further down the line. If literally it's just what colour we paint the gate, forget it. Some elements will be governed by planning laws. I say DCOs, this is very robust. But you can use your constraints mapping that you did at the start to identify the level of support and potential anti-groups within the community to go back and look at this level of influence and develop mitigation programs before you have to go public. And also consider community ownership. We, in the other room, we were talking about it earlier on today. It's a fantastic tool. And it's in our armory, and I really don't think we're using or, or at least looking at it as an option as much as we should do. So they've got to believe they've also been listened to. As I say, if it's a DCO process, the evidence of influence is part of that. You have to document it for every single response and show how it's been considered. For most of us, that isn't the case. But there's no reason why you can't play back the fact that somebody's been listened to. Usually, you can kind of predict what most of the objections are going to be along lines of visual impact and, and <coughs> issues with haulage routes and things like this. So you can come up with ways of responding to those in advance. And every letter deserves a letter back. And it isn't hard work. There are brilliant pieces of software out there. Um, we use a piece called Darzin that will literally just paste together a very tailored response back to somebody's query. You can't just get away with tip boxes, because uh, people are write letters anyway. So you've got to be ready to respond. And the thing about playback loops, as they're called, they're brilliant at generating social media interest. Now, a lot of people shy away from social media, because they think if they go and open up a Facebook page, they'll just get loads of anti-activity. Well, you get that anti-activity anyway. I mean, they're going to start a Facebook page. They will do. And if they've got the total use of the internet and social media and you're not playing, it's so working in their favor. If you do have a Facebook page, you can actually use it through things like this to build up advocacy. And Mark's done a fantastic job, um, we were talking earlier on next door, in building a, an entire community online that supports wind farms in Powys. And it's a fantastic asset. And people do, unfortunately, shy away from it. And more importantly, it has a positive knock-on for the industry as a whole. When somebody hears they might have a wind farm in their area, one of the first things they're going to do is do a search on the internet. And if all they're seeing is negative comment from other communities, it makes it difficult for everyone. So all this goes for solar as well, by the way, and renewables in general. I keep referring back to wind farms because that was the, the illustration at the start. Now, the loyalty ladder, we've mentioned advocates. The brilliant thing about advocacy for programs is because they help build themselves. People will target their friends for and convert them 
and move from like this to being an advocate. And so it's self-fulfilling. You can just, once it gets going and you're doing it well, you can just stoke the fire. What you've got to do still is respect the outcome. And that goes for both, both parties. Hopefully, you've influenced your politicians through all these routes and ways of communicating, and that's the outcome. You get a nice big headline that says, renewables gets the go-ahead. But realistically, if you get turned down because a group is against you, there's something that was wrong originally you should be able to identify as, as you can with other constraints. And I know that's quite a harsh slide, but if it doesn't get built, it was the wrong site. It didn't get built. And it's as simple as that. But it's a long and slow process. So remember, don't cut corners. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Uh, explaining the problems with that is, uh, feels rather like dancing, uh, jumping on a corpse, to be, to be honest, at the moment. Um, by the way, the Chinese are not going to uh, in, in invest in, 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 um, in uh, projects organised by Hitachi either. Um, they're not going to do anything to the sea for a start. But um, anyway, to get on with my... Um, yeah, well, anyway, that, that I'll, I'll sit, I've said it all. I'll sit down. This is next. Oh, right, OK. Um, well, a lot of you might have seen this chart produced by Bloomberg's. You can see solar power, massive reductions in costs, and continuing um, held up at the moment by uh, embargoes on Chinese exports by the U US and the EU, of course. That's another story. Let's gloss over that one. Onshore wind costs, this is an American study, they've been coming down more than that since 2013. There was a spike along with a lot of energy sources at the time of um, the oil price crisis. They're com coming down on once again. Here. Certainly in other countries where you don't have to pay the utilities a, a large cut to um, compensate for uh, their losses in power production in their power stations. Whoops, shouldn't say that. Um, nuclear power, though, of course, the cost steadily going up and continuing to do so for various reasons, environmental issues being one of them. And this is a nuclear power station. This is one in Finland. It's been looking much the same now for uh, 10 years and will remain the same for a long time. And you might say, well, well they're building that one. Yes, uh, built by the French state, a company called Arriva, which has gone bust recently. Now, don't ask me how a state-owned company can go bankrupt, but it's managing to do that. And so that, that's what you get. Either, you, either, you, either the state issues a blank check, which in this case is done by a foreign government, it's supposed to be a lost leader, and by God, it certainly is. <laughs> it's lost. Um, anyway, so what about evidence-based policy? Well, so this is supposed to run in nuclear power's favour. I, I cannot believe this. Um, you know, uh, people always refer to some work by a guy who, 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 who says that fast-breeding reactors are the ultimate form of energy supply. I just cannot believe People actually still uh, people believe that in this country. But anyway, but let, let's look at the costs. If you... Um, I, I, offshore wind, despite the government's spin on it, uh, it's cheaper than nuclear power. I mean, I, I've, done, I've done some calculations on the basis of... Well, let's use the government's contracts. Now, we all know, or most of us know, that Hinkley C isn't going to be financed for its advertised price, or for any price for that matter, but let's take them as it is and in, uh, avoid the fact that they've already been given, that they've already been offered a 10 billion pound loan guarantee, which re renewable investors, uh, there's very few of them ever, ever get. Um, but they said, oh well, wind power only lasts for 20, 25 years, whereas nuclear power lasts for 60 years. Uh, there isn't a single nuclear power station in the world that's ever lasted anything like 60 years, by the way. They closed down average lifespan 40 to 45 years. And, um, and by the way, there are wind turbines in California that are over 30 years old, uh, still going. But anyway, so if you take an average life expectancy of 45 years, and with the offshore wind parks, by the way, after 15, 20 years, you, could, you, you, you can, it hasn't been done yet, but I, I reckon it will be done. They'll be refurbished, rebladed for considerably, for a fraction of the cost of their original um, installation. And so they can carry on, certainly uh, on a, a contractual basis, maybe £60 per megawatt hour for a further 15, 20 years, and so on. And uh, if you do that using the government's auction contract price of £120 per megawatt hour that has been given to a couple of offshore wind farms uh, in February. 
you get a price of £78 per megawatt hour over 45 years. Whereas, of course, Hinkley C, if you cost it exactly the same basis over 45 years, assume after 35 years it will just get a whole wholesale power price of, say, £50 per megawatt hour. That's the price you get. So offshore wind is already cheaper than um, uh, Hinkley C, even if it could be built for that price and ignoring the fact that it's getting this £10 billion loan guarantee. And the rest, by the way. Well, there's a lot of the rest. On, what about onshore wind? Well, onshore wind, it's even, even, even more of a shoe in Same calculations. You know, you've got £80 per megawatt hour contracts in the, um, in the renewable auction in February. Um, if you, you know, you have to have a couple of those running back to back and so on, and then you get the wholesale power price for a few years in between them and so on. And uh, Hinkley C, again, £84 per megawatt hour. So the farms also, you do broadly similar calculations, and they're still a little bit more expensive than onshore wind on average, probably, but the prices of them are, ca uh, uh, are coming down. They, they, they come in less than Hinkley C as well. Now, not many people, people talk about cutbacks at DEC and so on. Well, there's not much scope for cutbacks at DEC because almost all the DEC spending actually goes on nuclear waste decommissioning. And this amount, this is 1% of UK's um, spend, uh, public spending, over £600 billion a year. This puts into the, this, this makes all the, alleged subsidies to renewable energy put on the back of our electricity bills look like small potatoes by comparison. These guys have been getting this money. And, uh, uh, and by the way, the future stations, they'll be paid by the, for the decommissioning of the future power station will be paid for by the state as well. It's just that we won't be around. Oh, well, a couple of you might be around in 60 or 80 years, I don't think I will. Um, Jenny, you might. You, you look like you might make. Anyway, um, so where is it going? Well, I did, I've got a picture of Steve Jobs there. I mean, I, it, I don't know how much storage we're, we're going to need, but it's all the rage. People are buying these things, you know, uh, in America. I'm not sure there's many around Cardiff, but um, little storage devices. But, but uh, electric car, he also does this Tesla as well, electric cars. Um, you know, naught to 60 in 4.3 se seconds. I wish I could afford them. But there's, with all items of conspicuous consumption as these are, they come down in price, and they'll be a very effective storage devices as well, aiming to balance out renewables. By the way, technically speaking, nuclear power is awful for that because it's, uh, it's, dis given, being, it's given dispatch priority. And uh, wind power, uh, and you read the Renewable Energy Foundation complaining about wind farms being given big constraint payments for them to close down. Well, that's because nuclear power can't be turned off. It's nuclear's fault, actually, not, 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 not wind powers. Anyway, my final, my final thought is, and this is a point to the renewable energy industry, yes, the costs are coming down, but don't be victims of your own propaganda because you, it's a capital-intensive... Um, it's a capital-intensive energy source, you're going to need what they call long-term PPAs, long-term contracts with guaranteed prices in the future. You're going to need these after 2020. And let's, and let's get renewables to be given long-term uh, con contracts with guaranteed prices after 2020 rather than the fantasy nuclear power stations. That's what we need. We need renewable energy targets not decar these decarbonisation targets that include these fantasy nuclear power plants. Thank you very much. <laughs> <clears throat> now moving on to um, Jenny Hogan then. Jenny um, is going to be talking about the Scottish renewable energy targets and whether or not they will be met. So um, look forward to hearing whether that's right or wrong. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, um, I'm Jenny Hogan, I'm from Scottish Renewables, um, and I've been asked to talk about what does the 100% renewable electricity, or what does 100% renewable electricity feel like, which is a difficult question to answer. 
not least because we've not got there yet, so I'll have no idea how it feels. <laughs> but um, I'll do my best to, to try and guess. Um, but basically, I'm going to focus mainly on the progress towards the target which we have in Scotland, which specifically um, is to generate the equivalent of 100% of our electricity consumption from renewable sources. Uh, it's very important to get those words right because uh, there's a lot of confusion around the target. We, we generate more than we use in Scotland, so it doesn't actually mean 100% of generation. It's just the equivalent of 100% of consumption. Um, so what I'm going to cover very briefly, um, I'll give you a bit of a sense of the energy uh, consumption uh, realm in Scotland and, and what is electricity's share within that because it's, it's quite small. Um, touch briefly again on the targets themselves. Um, and then I'll spend a little bit more time on, on looking at the progress of the renewable sector to meet in those targets, um, but spend probably the most time looking at the outlook. Are we likely to meet that target? Um, I'm not going to answer the question, yes or no, but I'll hopefully leave you all with some information to come to your own conclusions on that. Um, and then I'll, I'll give you a bit of a sense of what lies ahead as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about how this compares to Wales, but you may obviously want to draw your own conclusions on how that compares to the situation here as well. So the energy consumption realm in Scotland, um, as you can see here, more than half of our energy consumption is in the form of heat, um, and electricity is only about a fifth of that. So um, electricity has been the main area where we've, we've really driven forward and, and generated lots um, of electricity from renewables. Um, and we're at a very low base in the other sectors, heat and, and transport. So although electricity sometimes feels extremely difficult, um, it's easy by comparison <laughs> to the other sectors. So we've got that to look forward to. Um, this chart just gives you a bit of a sense of the, the targets for each of those sectors. Um, it's based on 2012 data, so it's a little bit out of date now. Um, the top one is for electricity. Um, we're actually now hovering around the 50% mark now, so we're a wee bit further ahead than that shows. But you can also see, again, we're only at about 3 to 4% for heat and transport, um, although doing better on, on uh, energy consumption reduction, which is, is promising. Now, this chart gives you um, a bit of a, a better sense of how the renewable, sector, uh, the renewable electricity sector is progressing. So as you can see, over the past sort of eight years or so, there's been steady growth. And we're now meeting, uh, or we now have installed seven, roughly seven gigawatts of renewable electricity capacity. Um, that equates to, as I said, about 50% of our consumption equivalent. So in order to meet the 100% target within five years, we have to double that. So we, we're looking at around about 14 gigawatts, give or take, for 2020. And this is how that renewables uh, installation that we have at the moment, how that breaks down. So as you can see, by far the majority is from onshore wind, the, the green section, about two thirds from onshore wind at the moment, um, followed by hydro, the dark orange section. And then all the other technologies are making up quite small proportions at the moment. But um, if I draw your attention to the, the sort of light orange or dark yellow one, which is about 190 odd uh, megawatts, that's offshore wind. Um, we expect that hopefully to grow substantially because we have now about four gigawatts of offshore wind projects with planning consent in Scotland. So if those go ahead or most of those go ahead, then obviously that chart will change quite dramatically. And this chart gives you the sense of what's to come. So this is the pipeline. So you can see again that the green band on the right is the seven gigawatts or so of what's installed, what's operational. But then we've got about eight and a half gigawatts of projects with consent or under construction already. So a huge amount actually still to come. And when you add that to the, the four gigawatts in planning, um, you get nearly 20 gigawatts of, of uh, capacity, which would suggest that we can easily meet our 14 gigawatts 2020 target if all of that were to go ahead. But of course, we know that it won't all go ahead. Um, and this is taken from a, a Scottish government publication recently produced. And I've, I've just taken the quote from the right where they themselves recognise that there are a number of factors which mean that not all projects consented will progress to commissioning and the renewable electricity target therefore remains challenging. So uh, they're quite right. And this is the chart that I want to spend a bit more time explaining. So what I've tried to do here is just depict where we are and how easy it is to meet the 2020 target. So the full chart is the 14 gigawatts or thereabouts that we need to meet it. 
The dark blue half on the right-hand side is the seven or so gigawatts that we have consented. Um, and then the next uh, slice just at the bottom there, the 630 megawatts, that's what's now in construction at the latest figures. So again, you would assume, you would hope that all of that, or maybe most of that, should contribute towards the target, assuming that all gets built um, and, and there's no problems. The next slice along is the 1,500 megawatts of renewable electricity projects that now have a contract for difference awarded to them or have an investment contract under the uh, financial investment decision enabling regime. So that's a little bit less certain. Um, you would hope as well that all of those projects will deliver on their milestones and will be generating by 2020 if everything goes well. But obviously this is a new regime we're in, very difficult to meet uh, criteria, strict contract conditions. Um, there's a lot at stake and so we, we don't know if they're gonna be able to deliver or not, but Again, you would hope that they will by 2020. And that also includes around a gigawatt of offshore wind projects. Again, large, large offshore wind projects in deeper waters, not easy projects to deliver. So a bit of a bigger question mark around those ones, but hopefully we'll go ahead. The next slice um, is about three and a half gigawatts that we have now of onshore renewables projects. So that's predominantly onshore wind. And again, they've all got uh, planning consent. So again, you would, assume that the majority of those should be able to go ahead and deliver by 2020. Um, I should point out though that some of those will have a grid connection date beyond 2020. So some of those won't actually be able to deliver by then. The majority of them, or a good chunk of them, we hope should go into the renewables obligation process um, before it closes in 2017, or potentially sooner than that, if we go by what Amber Rudd's been saying lately. So again, how much, much of that will go through that process, we don't know, but hopefully a fair chunk at least. And then of course there'll be some that will choose to bid into the CFD process and others that won't go ahead at all. Um, so that last bright red chunk at the top is just the remainder, what's left when you add all that together. That's what's left to meet the target. So we're looking at just over a gigawatt and I can pretty much guarantee that that will be bigger because as I've said, some of these projects just won't go ahead or won't, won't meet uh, the 2020 deadline. Um, but may of course deliver beyond 2020. And the one thing that I've not factored into this chart is that we have, as I've noted just at the top there, there are three gigawatts of offshore wind projects with planning consent. That's not including the ones that already have a, a CFD or, or investment contract. So on top of those, there's another three gigawatts of offshore wind farms with a planning consent, and they will be going into, no doubt, the next CFD rounds. So they'll be fighting with all of the other UK projects to try and get uh, a CFD in the, in the upcoming rounds. So I guess the point is that there's plenty of projects there and there's plenty of um, megawatts, um, but they're, I guess the game has changed now, as we all know, and it's much harder now to, to, to meet all of these deadlines, meet all of these criteria. So the big white question mark in the middle is for you to answer if you think we are in uh, a good position to meet the targets or not. I think it's all to play for. Um, I should also just note as well, those uh, offshore wind projects, some of those are currently waiting for a judicial review process from RSPB to go through, which is on Marine Scotland's consenting decisions. So again, that's yet another very big question mark on whether those projects will be able to proceed. And I've also not mentioned wave and tidal, just purely because the numbers are low enough to not make a significant difference on meeting the target, but they're obviously in there as well. So. Just a couple more slides to go. Um, I won't go into this in detail, but I just wanted to flag this up, that this depicts the whole levy control framework budget that we have. So you've got the, the feed-in tariff in green along the bottom, uh, the renewables obligation in blue, and uh, CFDs and investment contracts in red, and the black dots at the top are the cap for each of these years. So it just gives you a sense of, you know, we don't have an awful lot um, of budget there to play with in the next few years, but that's what we're all gonna be. Um, competing over and again I won't read through all of this but it just highlights some of the things that we need to now be focusing on for the next months really um, and the main ask that we're putting towards uh, DEC is to provide some more uh, foresight on future budget rounds uh, future budget allocation rounds and uh, future strike prices as well for the established technologies and of course, looking beyond that into how the levy control framework might extend beyond 2020, which comes to some of the points that David was just making. 
and this is the last slide that I just want to leave you with to come back to that bigger picture of the whole energy sector. Um, this graph just highlights the, basically the, the um, energy uh, demand levels that fluctuate over a four year period. The top line in blue is heat. The middle gray line is transport and the bottom red one is uh, electricity. And as you can see, heat is uh, pretty crazy <laughs> by comparison. And that, so it's not only more than half of our energy use, but it uh, has fluctuating demand patterns as well. So in terms of what comes next, um, as well as continuing to work on, on electricity, we do need to start thinking on the whole system and how do we decarbonize the whole system. So looking at heat, transport, storage, decentralized systems, as some of the previous speakers have touched on. So I think the future holds lots of opportunities, but, uh, but obviously we are in quite a testing time at the moment. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Danielle. Yeah. Well, very much on time. Um, over to you people, if, if you could um, raise your hand to, to ask a question and also to uh, indicate uh, who you are and where you're from, if you could, please. Who would like to start us off? Gentleman there? Um, well, first of all, um, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any specific local targets on local authorities. It's certainly not something that's been required for local authorities to do. Um, and there are very, very much so there's you know, different views, different uh, levels of enthusiasm, I think you could say, across Scotland um, in, in terms of what local authorities are um, consenting or otherwise. Um, but as I say, so there's no... There's no requirement from them. It really just depends on ensuring that the local authorities are following Scottish government policy properly. And I mean, that's something that we monitor ourselves to make sure that that is happening. Um, and, you know, that's an ongoing process to try and tighten that up. And particularly as policy and guidance is changing all the time, local authorities are always struggling to kind of keep up with that. So, so that's probably the main, one of the main challenges. Um, and sorry, what was the other part of the question again? <laughs> Ah, right, okay. mm. Well, so it's obviously monitored at Scottish Government level anyway. They, they monitor um, progress towards the target. In fact, many of these charts I've, I've shown here are actually Scottish Government charts. Um, and in terms of filtering that down, again, it's... it's it, I think the, the, the question here, which I think you may be alluding to, is whether planning decisions are, are being affected by the fact that we're getting closer to the target. Um, it, that's the question that we're really asking ourselves at the moment, so I, I don't have an answer to you, but um, it's certainly something that we are having to keep an, a very close eye on um, and listen to what the, the kind of planning decisions are um, saying at the moment. Are they actually referring to the fact that we're getting closer to the targets? I think there have been one or two cases quite recently where that, that, that sort of language is starting to change, um, so it is a bit of a, a risk now, and we need to make sure that we're communicating properly that, you know, the game's not up yet. <laughs> um, yeah. And oh, Sorry, I was just going to say, and, and that's why long-term targets or vision is obviously important. Yeah, if I could be a mic controversial in, in <laughs> Scotland, I'm just a bit worried here whether, whether the Scottish <laughs> government isn't sort of thinking about, oh, well, we can be independent with 100% equivalent from uh, renewable energy and never mind the uh, UK <laughs> target, which really needs more from uh, Scotland for its decarbonisation programme, I would have thought a 150% target by 2025 from Scotland uh, would not be implausible, especially when you chuck in other things like solar PV farms uh, 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 and other things. I'm a bit worried about that. I mean, if you look at the, S the SNP manifesto, um, it's not actually totally uh, by any means incompatible with what the Conservatives say, because as the SNP has said, we'll support onshore wind until 2020. Mm. And it's not, not as brilliant as what people think. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that. Um, next question? Gentleman there?
Well, it's the usual fantasy coming from uh, deck. So I'm, I'm just presenting my <laughs> figures. It's a bit of a no-brainer, really. So um, there we are. Um, <laughs> anybody else uh, like to uh, come in on this or take another point? Whilst people are thinking about the next question, I might use my I position. I think it would be useful also if we could encourage DEC to also give us their take on the analysis of the, uh, that the IMF released yesterday on the real costs of fossil fuels. So we're not just comparing nuclear and renewables, we're comparing nuclear, fossil fuels and renewables <coughs> with the real cost, all of the externalised costs brought in so that we can see the real price that we're paying. That's a very good point. And uh, I was just going to come to you, in fact, Paul, because of your uh, previous presentation. I was going to just ask you, suppose that somebody said to you, well, you know, it's great to be thinking about zero carbon, but we're not really going to get there in the time scale you're talking about. But what would we have to do to make a real significant move in that? What would be the one thing, then, that you think <coughs> is, 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 you know, is, is, is that key, that silver bullet to sort of move us in the right direction? Well, the real thing that we need is cross-party leadership from all of the politicians just to say, yes, we must do this. We will no longer consider this as a party political football and show some of the leadership that we saw in 1939 to actually deal with the real challenge we face. Then if, if we imagine, you know, if we'd had to construct all of the tank defences around the coast of Britain and we'd had to do all of the air defences, if we'd had to go through the same process, the loops that we're going through, for the challenges that we face for climate, we simply wouldn't have achieved it. We have to move beyond where we are at the moment. And that requires a bit of a cultural shift. Cultural shifts require clear political leadership. I think that's absolutely right. And uh, that, that's got to be number one. And certainly something we need in Wales, a bit of political leadership, I have to say, uh, in this particular area. But what in terms of the actual, you know, the actions, it's when you've got the consensus. What would you say, right, you know, the main thing to do is integrated, detailed modelling of what needs to happen. We can't look at decarbonising electricity, decarbonising transport and decarbonising heating because they, they all interact. We need to decarbonise all of them. We need to match powering down demand back from the extreme levels it is now on any historical timeline or any geographical comparison with other nations in the world we use an extreme amount of energy. We have to merge that in with a plan to capture our own indigenous renewables to be able to get the whole thing working together. And that means getting business and industry involved. To get business and industry involved, we have to bring in the externalized costs that have just been put off for future generations. Once those costs are brought in, the market forces will work I in a sensible way. But it, Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market is carbon blind at the moment. What about a carbon tax? And would that, would that, would that be a key thing going forward? Well, a tax is one way of approaching it. But actually bringing in the externalized costs isn't adding a tax. It isn't another thing that people can point at as a burden pushing up the prices of energy for hardworking families. Just to get people to pay the real cost for what it is. How do you do that without, without a tax? Do you think people just say, oh, I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay more? You know, how do you do that? You then? begin to quantify the effects. Uh, if you actually look at the, the bills that will come to local authorities to actually deal with climate adaptation, it's enormous. If we look at the costs to particularly other parts of the world, if we look at the costs to the healthcare system of burning fossil fuels in ma en masse in urban environments, in lung diseases. Those costs are real and quantifiable and can be brought in. Also look at the amount of money we're actually still spending subsidizing a 150-year-old industry. It's not a, a fledgling new industry that needs kick-starting. It's, it's an ancient industry that's getting massive global amounts of subsidies. Good point. I, I, I agree with all that, but I think what you really need is to decide what technologies you want, and you need long-term power okay. purchase, purchase agreements before and after, you need to award them before and after 2020, to plausible, cheap technologies, onshore wind, offshore wind, solar PV farms, various others, but of course, not nuclear power, because it's just a waste of paper. Any, uh, any other burning? 
questions? I've got a lady in the front here, yes. Ben, Ben, Ben. ben. Um, it is something that's um, getting increasing attention now. I think we're really at a turning point with the Scottish Government and that the uh, that, that graph that I showed earlier of the, the levy control framework with the little black dots showing the caps, um, that is a chart, and also the last one with the heat uh, you know, graph looking uh, like that. Um, they, they're both charts, again, that I took from a Scottish Government presentation and uh, very recently, and it, there's a, a very clear sense from the recent talks that I've seen of them and just from conversations with them, that they are really shifting their focus now increasingly to heat um, and that whole systems approach. Um, and I think partly because they are looking at that, that graph of the caps and seeing that there's not a lot more perhaps to play here, to play for here in electricity, um, and that we do need to start thinking longer term. So, so heat is, is moving up the agenda, and there, there is uh, that does include, I think, some projects on heat transfer. Um, I'm not, I don't have any specifics, but I could take your details afterwards and get back to you on that. Um, but it is something that is taking, you know, getting increasing traction um, at the moment. But I'm happy to have a chat with you later about it. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Lady there. Yeah, um, I put a lot. Of and you are sorry. <laughs> you academics, you researchers, how are you all going to get the message out there? Because it can't just be down to people like me. Good point. No. Um, well, that's a good point to, to end with. So over you go for a last statement from each of the people here, really responding to Pippa and sort of um, mm, wrapping up. Yeah. Well, I think well, this session's called a revolution. From what you were saying, I think we all need to get out onto the street and start marching. <laughs> um, and that, that may well be part of the solution. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a complex one. It's like with everything. How, there's no real clear answer to this. How do we change that culture that we were talking about? You know, how do we encourage voters to vote for parties that are proposing sensible, pragmatic uh, policies? Um, obviously, education is a big part of that, but that's a long, slow process. Um, we certainly in my organisation, the, the way that we try to focus is, is making sure that we're getting good, solid information and getting it out there into the press as often as possible and d as um, intelligently as possible, so it gets to the right places, makes a decent headline, you know, timing and all of that sort of stuff. 
Um, and so that's where a lot of these guys come in in terms of producing that information and we have to make sure we're getting it out there. Um, I think that's, that's the best thing that we can really um, offer. Uh, I, I mean, in Scotland, we're in a slightly different position in that we, slightly, I, think, I don't think it's as big as it looks like. When you look at that big yellow map of Scotland at the moment, it makes you think that everybody's suddenly gone pro-renewables or, or, you know, whatever the SNP are saying. But it's not quite as simple as that. It's only about 50% that voted, you know, for the SNP. And um, it it's actually is quite a mixed picture, even in Scotland. Okay. Um, Anyway, yes, Thanks there's hopefully that. some ideas there. David. <laughs> David. Oh, we need a mixture of um, emotion and practical plans to follow it up. Myself, I'm pretty pathetic as far as contributing to all this goes. I write stuff. Uh, I write a blog, by the way, Dave Tokes Green Energy blog. Remember, write that down, Dave Tokes Green Energy blog and Google all that. that that's a lot. But besides that, I, I write a lot of tedious academic journals, uh, paper, papers for journals and books and things on <coughs> tedious technical subjects. Right. Thanks for that. Much <laughs> 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 appreciated. Jamie. Um, I think it's got to be one of a, accountability, Pippa, and to, to make communities view themselves as an accountable body for CO2 is, is one way of doing it. There's some great community energy groups out there, um, several thousand of them throughout the UK now. Uh, staffed with, with fantastic volunteers that go around their, their village and community informing people of how they can reduce their CO2 footprint. And also, more importantly, how they can get around the fairly bureaucratic uh, elements and the nature in which they get grants. I mean, there are great ways in which you can get very cheap LED light bulbs if you know how to fill in the right form and things like this. So these groups are good at pushing the knowledge out there and making an area feel accountable. And I think it's that teamwork factor that we've got to really push from a groundswell up because we can do all we want and try and influence the politicians, but there's nothing like a groundswell from the base up. And if you match that with action on the ground, you can't go wrong. I think we mm -hmm. have to recognize the need for a cultural shift. Cultural shifts have improved the lives of millions of people by transforming attitudes to race, to gender, to health and safety in the workplace, to class. We need to have a cultural shift around our attitude to climate futures. And so we've been deeply involved with Arts Council Wales. We've produced a report, Culture Shift. We've been involved with the emergence process, bringing artists in and helping creatives help us see the world differently because the reality TV that's on our TVs day after day after day is not reality. It's so far from reality, it's embarrassing. We need to actually live it and ground ourselves in the evidence. He said, sitting in a room with all the curtains closed, with the light on, <laughs> windows closed, with the air conditioning on, drinking Highland Spring bottled water. <laughs> we need to live it, which is part of the Centre for Alternative Technologies' unique contribution, perhaps. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. And uh, if I might just um, respond as well, Pippa. Um, I, I think it's a combination of, of incentives and targeted taxes myself. You've got to get the market to, to, to change. And I think in terms of incentives, you both need incentives for the producers of the new technologies, the innovations that are going to be needed there, but also for the NIMBYs. We need to incentivize those NIMBYs, you know, yes. not to be NIMBYs. You know, I was involved in a wind farm development up in North Wales. We didn't get the planning uh, in the end. It was, it, was, it was fought, you know, people, local people fought against it. If we could have offered them free electricity from that wind farm, there's only about 2,000 of them living within 10 miles of the wind farm. You know, we could have offered them free electricity for the next 25 years. You know, we'd have had them on our side. So you've got to incentivize the blockages, and you've got to incentivize the producers, and I think some targeted taxes will get us there. But thank you all very much indeed for your inputs. Thank you all very much indeed from the, from the from, from our contributors today. And just a, a final thank you for all your efforts. Thank you very much indeed. You can pick up your six page summaries on the table at the front. It's all free to download. Thank you. Do visit our stand downstairs.